Hello, everybody. Welcome, bonjour. Welcome to my talk, Why Barricade the Door if the Window is Open? Why indeed? The next half an hour, we're going to talk about various ways uh, to get into the Kubernetes. And also, we'll try to make sense of those ways to come up with some kind of framework that will help us think about them. Um, okay, my name is Shay, Shay Berkowitz. I am a threat researcher in WIZ. You might know me through one of these projects. Uh, right now, I'm, as I said, I'm happy to be the part of the amazing WIZ threat research team, where I'm responsible, among other things, for uh, the main of Kubernetes threat research. OK, let's talk about clusters. Um, so I was told that every good talk needs to have a hook to something to engage the audience, to explain the motivation. Um, but I think in this case, we don't really need that much motivation because it's kind of obvious, right? The same way that you don't want to get burglars in your house, you don't want to get attacker to give them access into your cluster, be it your first cluster that you're staging through some kind of click in the cloud UI by choosing the default options, or be it your cluster number 5,000 that you're staging through some kind of uh, fancy Terraform. Um, your primary security concern, the first security concern, is to make sure that it's not easy to get into your cluster, of course, before you run some kind of fancy KSPM and uh, audit security solutions. And so we'll use this house as a metaphor for the cluster. By the way, did somebody recognize what's this house? Which movie is it from? <laughs> That's right. Yeah, McAllister's house. So we'll use the misfortunes of that those wet bandits, uh, Marv and Harry, I think their name was, uh, that were trying to get into the house, um, and Kevin was trying to fend them off. So we'll use those analogies uh, as an analogies to the potential attackers that try to get into your clusters. Uh, just something to, to make the talk more engaging and more perhaps intuitive as well. So now, the first reason is obvious, of course, but there are a couple more reasons, uh, more subtle. So the um, for example, these are the numbers from our 2023 security report. It takes 22 minutes for attacker or for malicious scans to reach newly staged EKS cluster. Okay, so if you have the cluster that's reachable publicly, assume attackers know about it. Okay, that's your assumption. And then there's another even more subtle reason, again from the same security report. Um, I'll explain about report first. So we took a bunch of data from the consented uh, customers. We processed it and mapped that data on the stages of the typical attack chain in the Kubernetes cluster. OK, so initial access, lateral movement, privilege escalation, and impact. And what we found out is that the lateral movement and privilege escalations were the uh, weakest points in this attack chain. Um, probably because of the uh, multitude of options inside the Kubernetes cluster to move laterally or privilege, escalate privileges, but also because of the lack of security controls that customer employ, even the controls that already exist, like network policies, using the same namespace, etc., which puts pressure on initial access. So we're saying here, let's first secure the initial access and make it harder just to get first. Okay. Now, house and me as a metaphor is nice, but we still need to remember the original architecture, of course, right? Because, um, so we'll talk about the control plane, uh, the blue components, the blue ports, but also about data plane and maybe a bit more. Now, to extract the maximum value from this talk, um, we not just only going to talk about the tec tec technique, like how the attackers can actually get into your cluster, but also about the detections and protections, because ultimately we want to know what to do about this, how we can protect our clusters. So when you see those icons, the, this red uh, lamp and the green bucket, you'll know what that means. For every initial access vector, I'll, I'll, sh I'll share with you the detection methods and protection methods. All with the final goal, after half an hour, to have some kind of framework 
and means to think about future misconfigurations and vulnerabilities in the context of initial access. So that the next, when the next leaky vessels will come out, and they will, you'll be able to think about it, okay, to put it into perspective and say, okay, I have to patch my worker nodes immediately, for example, or upgrade my cluster, or I can ignore it for now, it, and it won't affect my initial access, okay? All right, before we jump in, in into the control plane, very quickly, our Watt AUTL toolbox, uh, we have typically sensor or EDR solution that's, uh, that's visible on the kernel level, it knows about containers. It's probably Kubernetes aware and cloud aware, perhaps even. We have on the Kubernetes level, we have Kubernetes admission controller and the audit log, of course. And on the cloud level, we also have various logs, cloud detections, uh, I don't know, various detection streams, but also VPC flow logs, etc. So we have a bunch of those. It's good to keep that in mind. Okay, let's dive in into the control plane. Of course, we're gonna start with Kubernetes API access. Why? Because it's, it's like a front door to your cluster, basically. And we want to secure our front door. Now, front door is only front door if it's a public, publicly accessible cluster, of course. However, what we found out is about 70% of the clusters are publicly accessible. Now, it's not immediately a problem. Because, let's say, attacker, anonymous user, reach your cluster, they get something like this, 403, okay, or 401. So if anonymous authentication enabled, like on EKS or GKE, for example, then they'll get 403 and they will get mapped automatically to the system anonymous user. Okay, what can they reach? What can they get from this? Well, they can probably fingerprint your, your cluster, okay, in slash version endpoint, fine. They know health of your cluster, okay. Maybe some something in certificate details. Not very interesting, um, however, the Kubernetes ARBAC misconfiguration can interfere. How? What happens if system anonymous or system unauthenticated group that's anonymous is mapped to are actually assigned a non-trivial role? So there are three trivial roles assigned always by default, which are not very interesting, but there are non-trivial roles perhaps may be assigned. And in that case, the external unauthentic user, instead of getting 403 or 401, they will get something like this. The actual list of pod specifications, JSON, which might contain, of course, some sensitive data. So it's like leaving your front door open. Now, in truth, this is extremely rare condition. This is what our data shows, because people are already aware about this misconfiguration. It, it got enough uh, publicity, I guess. Okay, uh, so chances are, if you see something like this, think about honeypot first and then cluster. But if, of course, it's, if it's your, in your environment, then it's not a honeypot. Um, okay, how can we detect that type of access? Everything related to Kubernetes API access is cube audit log. Okay, so this is how it looks like for people who never seen cube audit log. It has user, username, group, action, and a resource. So that's what we're looking for, and we have all the information to put some kind of regular rule to detect this access. Great. However, sometimes the, your provider, your cloud provider, can butcher those audit logs. So in this case, this is how the audit log looks in the GKE version, unfortunately. And so, yes, you need to maintain several versions of your regular rules in this case. All right. What are we doing with this? How can we detect the access? Let's say attacker is abused this misconfiguration and they accessed it. Okay, how can we detect them? Well, anomaly rules is your friend here because this is uh, because that's how you know that system anonymous doing something something weird. But also KSPM because this misconfiguration is relatively easy to find or ARBA coded tool. Okay, so that was the first one. Now let's move on to kubeconfig. Kubeconfig is the file that tells kubelet, right, how to authenticate into the remote cluster. And it's typically saved in .cube slash config. Okay, great. The st its structure is as follows. It has three sections. First, list of clusters. Second, list of context. And third, list of users. And the third session is the most interesting one because it actually tells kubectl how to authenticate into the cluster, how to use that user material. 
So let's see how it's implemented in the, in the big three solutions. For EKS, it looks like this. So we have this exec session under the user, which basically tells kubectl run AWS thick client with the following parameters. Then it will get back some kind of exec credentials, and it will use those exec credentials to actually authenticate into the cluster. So what can we learn from this? First, don't run untrusted kubeconfig. Simple as this. If you download it somewhere from the, from the GitHub, right? Like there is execution context inside the kubeconfig. Second, you still need AWS credentials in this case. And same for a GKE. It uses the same GKE and AWS of a credential that's already on your laptop. So there are no new credentials in this case. In, if kubeconfig is leaked, then uh, nothing really happens. What I'm getting to is AKS. Okay? So AKS has three authentication modes. Local, entry ID, and coupled entry ID. Okay? In the local, which is the default mode, this is what you'll find in your kubeconfig. You'll find the client certificate, you'll find the token. Token, okay, short-term access. Now imagine this kubeconfig cube leaks. What are you gonna do? The thing is that the certificate is valid for two years. You leak your kubeconfig, go ahead and try to rotate all those certificates in your cluster. Basically, if you have AKS in local, uh, a local RBAC mode authentication, make sure that don't, don't leak uh, kubeconfigs. And that, and that happens a lot, actually. So this you can find on the GitHub, various secrets checked in into the public repositories. So you need to be very careful about it. How do you detect and protect against this? Well, to detect the access is anomaly rules against, are your friends? But for protection, we're talking here about the developer practices, coding practices, and secret scanning. You need to scan everything before you check it in in the public repositories, but also private repositories, of, co of course, because then after that they can become, become public. So don't, don't do this stuff, right, where somebody checked in GKE cache credentials into the public repo. Okay. Let's move on to the Kubelet API access. And for people here in the audience to say, what? Kubelet has API access? Uh, yes, apparently it does. It's not documented, though, but it's there. To find the endpoints, you need to dig deep into the code and to, to look at, the, at those endpoints, okay? But they are there. And it's running on AKS, GK, and EKS as well. Now, because it's not... <laughs> Like, it's not supposed to, uh, to be accessible, right? There is a reason why they didn't document this. Because it's only for the internal control plane components. And so uh, that's why I compare it to the, some kind of pet door inside the kitchen door. Uh, because again, it's not for the humans. It shouldn't be there. If it's there, that it's some kind of serious misconfiguration, or developers did something funny, or DevOps and you better be, uh, be aware of it. So in terms of detection, Kubeaudit will be blind to this because it goes straight to the kubelet. It doesn't go through the Kubernetes API access. So sensor is your friend in this case because it will probably monitor your local access um, if there is uh, some kind of local access to the port, typically 10 to 50, 10 to 54, those are the ports that kubelet API is served. To protect this, we're talking here about network exposure management and VPC flow logs, and perhaps some kind of secondary protections. All right, moving on, management interfaces. So there's this case of Tesla open dashboard that's being told again and again, and I'll use it again uh, since 2018, I think. Um, it doesn't happen anymore because you, you kind of need, it's not there by default, you need to install the dashboard and you need to actively expose it, but there are other types of dashboards. I'm talking MLflow, Kubeflow, Airflow, various add-ons. This is just so handy, it's like a kitchen backdoor, right, which you take the garbage out, but you need to keep, remember to keep it closed, right? So to detect this, again, we're talking about anomaly rules on Kube audit, same old. Uh, to protect, we're talking about network 
exposure management. If you see some kind of management port open, that's, that's your clue here. All right, so that's management interfaces. And now the last uh, access vector on the control plane is kubectl proxy. So kubectl proxy, I don't know how many of you have heard about it, but it's a weird beast. It's like, it's like that zip line, if you guys remember, like the zip line which Kevin used to exfiltrate after the burglars got in, uh, but the same zip line can be used to get in, right? And it's kind of hard to notice. It's not big because we're, we're looking at the windows, doors, garage, but there are also zip lines sometimes into your house. And that's this kubectl proxy. Because the thing is that everybody can run it. Everybody with access can run it on their local laptop or some kind of cloud VM jumper. Uh, give it dash dash port 9001. And that's it. And that's the connection to, into your cluster. And the, act, the thing is this action of kubectl proxy opening, Q, Kubernetes API sector, uh, server doesn't see it. It could be any port, depending on the dash dash port option. And this laptop or jumper station, it can be outside of the scope of your security solutions. Okay, that's why I'm saying it's like a zip line because it's gonna be super hard to detect. So make sure to cut it if you, if you have it. Um, now, Qbodit is, is blind to proxy opening, but sensor will, should detect the, the moment the proxy is open because it's like open port. So we're again talking about network exposure management, but this case, we're also talking about anti-fish and anti-malware techniques on the laptop of the developer that opened this proxy. All right, so to sum up the control plane, we talked about multiple initial access vectors, and we also associated the major risks to each of them. Let's see what we learned. Let's see how we can apply what we learned on the case of system authenticated misconfiguration that was discovered back in February, I think. The thing is, any user with a Google account or Gmail, and I think pretty much everybody here has one, can access the cluster, can authenticate into any cluster on the GKE. They will be automatically assigned to the system authenticated group. Now, because of the name system authenticated, of course, it sounds safe enough, like way safer than system unauthenticated. And so this, this misconception that people thought about it, and so they assigned admin level privileges to the system authenticated group. And so imagine what attacker can do. They go to GCP YUM, get the token, with the token authenticate to the Kubernetes API server, and do whatever the system authenticated is allowed them to do. So let's check the demo, how it looks like in practice. All right, so here on the right side, I have a cluster access, kubectl get. I'm just showing that if I provide any token, any random token, of course I won't be authenticated into the cluster because it doesn't know what to do with this token. On the left side, I'm the external user or attacker and I have Gmail account. Hello, okay. I'm using this API to get my own token. I'm getting the token and I'm passing it into the kubectl. I still don't have access, but I am user, some kind of user, weird number, but it kind of shows that something happened there, right? So now let's simulate this bad misconfiguration. So I'm creating this danger cluster all binding, literal danger where I'm signing system resource tracker girl, uh, rule to the system authenticated group, all right? And I'm trying the same get pods, and now I have access. Because the system resource tracker, which is embedded role in most clusters, it has some kind of privileged access there. It can do a bunch of stuff. So we are one misconfiguration away from the disaster on GKE clusters in this case. So that made 
uh, waves in the uh, in the community. And I don't forget to uh, <laughs> to quickly delete that misconfiguration, of course. Uh, okay. And we're stuck. Okay, so where can we place this in our framework, what we learned? Well, we are talking about Kubernetes API access. So it's got to be misconfiguration in the Kubernetes API access. And we're talking about RBAC misconfiguration, okay? So for detection, of course, once we're talking about Kubernetes API server, we're talking about Kubernetes audit log. And to protect this, we just need to a good KSPM solution or RBAC audit solution that will detect that dangerous role binding. So the rule you might want to use is this regular rule, which literally shows that, okay, we're looking at create, cluster role binding create verb. We are looking at this group with the name system authenticated, and the role ref associated them shouldn't be one of those three roles that's already there, which are trivial roles, okay? And this is how the actual cluster role binding looks from the API perspective. Okay, so that's the, what KSPM solution is looking for. So now we know how to solve this problem. Once the next GKE misconfiguration coming along, we know how to address this. Okay, Whew. one second breather. We're moving on to data plane. Okay, data plane is like um, the business that you run from the garage, right? Like Amazon or eBay, uh, where you send packages Trucks are moving in, trucks, trucks are moving out, and some packages can slip through and stay in your house, perhaps even malicious packages. What I'm getting at, I'm getting to the data plane access, right, that you're exposed through the services, and if attacker, if there's an application RC on your data plane, attacker, of course, can abuse it and find itself in the context of the pod execution, typically associated with some kind of service account in the namespace on the worker node. And from there, the name of the game is lateral movement, okay, or privilege escalation. Depends what they can do with those associated privileges. So now we're talking about how to confine the, uh, the attacker, right? Like, suddenly we're talking, okay, how do we protect from application RC? Well, it's, it's not really the scope of this talk. We, we're not gonna talk about application security. But there are ways, application logs, WAF, you name it, fuzzing. Um, but in terms of Kubernetes, KSPM for pod isolation can work. And protecting from some kind of secondary activities past the RC exploitation. Okay, let's say we don't have RC in our data plane. Some vendors actually offer execution as a service, okay? And our vulnerability research team has detected multiple cross-tenant vulnerabilities in services like Azure Cosmos DB, where they were running Jupyter Notebook. So that's juicy service. And at this point, we're talking about escape protections and protections against lateral movement and cross-tenant uh, violations. And in this in this context, I just want to say about to talk about Peach quickly that we it's the hardening. Uh, framework for the multi-tenant cloud applications and deployments. And we recently updated it and extended to the Kubernetes as well. And there's this namespace hound, which is a cute tool that we released and open sourced a couple weeks ago, that basically tests your, uh, oh, test your multi-tenancy setup. And for the red teamers in, in the crowd, it, it's, um, it basically can help you find all kind of lateral movement scenarios inside the cluster once the attacker is inside the cluster. Okay, good. Now, switching direction a bit, node port. Okay, node port is just another way to expose your data plane, but typically you expose the data plane through the load balancer or, I don't know, a gateway API. There is a way to expose it through the node port as well. It's a, it's a bit weird. It's typically the sign of some kind of diagnostics or debug access, and so typically you don't want this in your production clusters. But what we found that about 6% of clusters do have node port configured and exposed. 
we're just hoping that those are not production but test clusters. So now because it shouldn't be there, um, I would compare it to some kind of basement door under the garage and just let's let's just hope that the attackers won't find it or if they find it then they'll broke the, their neck uh, by trying to get there um, to detect it so it's like similar to the kubelet because to detect it you need local detection which means sensor to protect it though kspm sees the node port right so case good kspm solution should detect this and of course classic appsec protections if the if this uh, application is authenticated okay and of course <laughs> since we're talking about initial access we have to talk about malicious images so malicious images in your cluster every cluster uses the images of course pod, st pod is starting kubelet pulls the image okay how do you know if it's malicious or not so having malicious image inside your cluster is like inviting the fake police officer into your house for the recon, for example, um, you're basically giving them too much. Um, now, how this could happen? Well, it could be, it could be public registry with some kind of uh, maintainer credentials that leaked or somebody um, owns the account of that maintainer. It happens. We, we saw this with NPM a lot as well. It could be image name confusion. Think about Redis with double S. Redis is a super popular image, right? Or it could be image pool secret that leaked knownly or unknownly that has right permissions. And we saw our vulnerability uh, team as well saw multiple instances where image pool secret had right permissions to the registry. In this case, attacker can override that image. And there you go, you have a mal malicious image. Now, the important point here is that private clusters are also affected. So don't think that you can uh, stage the private cluster. Uh, you don't open it to the, uh, you don't expose it to the internet, but it still pulls images, right? So keep that in mind. Now, in terms of detection, how can we detect this scenario? Well, think about what malicious image would do when it starts, when it instantiates. Well, it doesn't know where it is, which, so it probably will first connect to the C2 instance, okay? So you can detect that connection through sensor or network monitoring tool. That's your way. To protect, of course, you can use image integrity verification, but also the registry security is also uh, the answer here. Okay, to, so to sum up, we talked about apps, execution as a service, images and now i want to show you the again the use case we're going to talk about leaky vessels leaky vessels is a set of serious pretty serious vulnerabilities that were discovered back i think at the end of january by snake researchers um, that allow attacker build time and container container sorry start runtime escape from the container to the host and that's what we're going to use in our attack chain, okay, in our demo. Perfect. Okay, so on the bottom right side, I'm starting my C2 server. NC-NLVP, everybody knows it. Okay, great. At the top, I'm pretending to be a cluster operator. All the cluster operator does is run some kind of image innocently named it's named cv 2024216626 just regular image which i built of course that's our malicious image so at the bottom left you see that's how this uh, the docker file looks like all it does is runs one command upon start it curls it sends the itsy shadow to my c2 image so it's a shadow of course is a sensitive file but the kick here is that this it's a shadow is not from the pod this is a shadow from the node file system you see that path traversal dot 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 that means that from inside the container the container will go up to the node file system and send it it's a shadow to my c2 instance so pretty cool if you ask me okay where can we place it in data of, well, of course, we're talking about image poisoning, image name confusion, so it's going to be there. And what's the primary protection about from this? Image integrity verification. Okay, now very quickly, other angles. <laughs> of course, you rarely run, 
run your clusters alone, right? You probably have multiple clusters, maybe thousands, but you don't run them in isolation. You have some kind of continuous delivery solution that stage them. You have some kind of users and cloud roles that interact with those clusters. So you don't run the clusters in isolation. And those two vectors can also be initial access vectors. So now, I don't want to discourage you from, like, it's not like everything that we, we had here is, is legit initial access, but keep an eye that uh, those, uh, those access, those vectors can also be abused by the attackers from the cloud to the, uh, to the containers and from the CI CD to your Kubernetes. So keep, keep that in mind. Okay, so to, the, to wrap it up, this is probably the most important slide that I want you to take from this uh, lecture. We talked about control plane, we talked about data plane, and we highlighted the most important risks for every initial access vector. We also touched a bit on cloud access and CI CD. Okay, so I hope that will help you to make sense in various initial access vectors to, for the Kubernetes cluster. Um, these are some of the links that I talked about. Thank you so much. If you have questions, I'm here. Thanks a lot.